good evening, good night, good morning to everyone who has joined us this afternoon for the our inaugural Emancipation Day lecture put on by the Hogard AME Zion Church in recognition of Emancipation Day. I am Reverend Deborah Grant. I'll be your moderator for the evening and I'll be doing just that. Just before we move on, just some housekeeping. We ask that you keep your audio in the off position during the presentation. We ask that you type all of your questions in the chat box that is on your right hand side or if you go to the bottom of your screen you will see the chat icon and you click on that. Please put your questions in there and I would ask them as we go along. If there are any additional questions, we will try to entertain those at the end of those that are already in the chat box. We prepare now for our opening prayer. Dear God, we are gathered this evening to recognize part of the journey in which your stolen ones had to take. Dear God, we thank you that we are at a place now where we can reflect on that journey and we can reflect on that journey in relation to what the promises are that you have for us as a people. Dear God, we thank you for bringing all those who are gathered now online. We look forward to the others joining us shortly. But more importantly, dear God, we thank you for opening our hearts and our minds to understand what our lecture this afternoon will be presenting to us, that we can see ideas and thoughts revealed to us in ways that we never thought before, but that would bring us into a better and closer understanding of our journey here on earth. So dear God, we thank you for taking complete control now of our proceedings this evening with all the blessings that are yours. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We now invite one of our youth, Brother Tariq Lovell, to bring us the introduction and the background to this evening's activities. Good, e good evening. Good evening. Uh, Go ahead. Emancipation Day, August 1st, 2020. The Emancipation Day holiday marks the end of slavery in Barbados, 1834. As Europe expanded, its colonial enterprise into the new world. Barbados became an English colony in the mid 17th century. It became an important producer of sugarcane and the need of labor meant that many slaves were brought from Africa to work in the sugar plantation. In 1807, trading in slaves was abolished in the British Empire, but not slavery itself. Religious, economic, and social factors contributed to the British Empire's abolition of slavery in the West Indies. Throughout the region, enslaved people had engaged in revolts, labor stoppages, and other, and every other, and every other forms of resistance which pressured imperial authorities who were eager to create peace, maintain economic stability in the colonies, to consider legislating widespread abolition. Whilst there had been minor slave revolts in Barbados, the large rebellion in the island history took place in 1816. The rebellion involved 20 20,000 slaves from over 20 plant, 70 plantations. 
The revolt failed and 120 slaves were killed in fighting, and 144 were executed following trial. The revolt was led by Buster, the head driver of the Bailey's plantation in St. Philip. Buster died in the fighting and became one of Barbados's national heroes. His statue now stands at Emancipation Roundabout on the island. Slavery was finally abolished throughout the British Empire by, slavery, by the Slavery Abolition Act 1833, which came into effect on August 1st, 1834. There was stiff resistance to the abolition of slavery and emancipation of the 800,000 enslaved Africans from the planter classes and merchant elite in the British colonies. Though slavery having been abolished until 1838, there was a four, four year apprenticeship period during which the newly free men continued to work with oak pay in exchange for living in huts provided by plantation owners. A ceremony celebration that a ceremony celebration, the emancipation of the slaves is held at Basel Statue. There are also parades, speeches, and demonstrations held by school children. Other celebrations include Emancipation Day Walk, Beach Fest, and Village Fest. Today, the Hogar African Episcopal Zion Church has added this inaugural emancipation lecture to this list as part of its prophet prophetic ministries to the people of Barbados, the Caribbean, and the wider African community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tariq. We are now getting to the meat of the matter. I now introduce you to Dr. William Akar, lecturer in community and voluntary sector studies at Burbett College, University of London. And he has the pleasure of introducing our main speaker, our lecturer, our pastor, Reverend Ronald Nathan. So Dr. William Akar, it's over to you. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Reverend. So it's my privilege to introduce um, Reverend Ronald Nathan, a dear friend and colleague. So Reverend Nathan is married to Glynis Brewster Nathan. And uh, hello, Glynis. Good to see that you're online uh, this evening as well. For those that don't know Ron so well. He has three adult children and nine grandchildren. He's completed studies at Ealing Bible College UK, Daystar University Kenya, Westminster College Oxford and Oxford University, and is currently enrolled in a PhD program at the University of South Africa. That's another trait of Ron's that I love that he's always has a first for knowledge and a first for learning. Not one of those people who claims to know it all, but somebody who's humble enough to keep seeking out new wisdom and new truth that can help his community and his people. He's been in Christian ministry for 42 years. Some of his appointments include Youth Minister, Clapham, London, 1978 to 80. Pastor in Kelly Village, Trinidad and Tobago, 1980 to 1984. Bible College Dean, Birmingham, UK, 1984-1985. Teaching Minister and Missionary in Kenya, 1985 through 1989. Guidance Counselor, Trinity College East, 2003 through 7. Social Development Consultant, from 2007 to 2016. Presiding Elder, AME Zion Churches, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 2008 to 2012. Pastor of Shaw AME Zion Church in Trinidad and Tobago, 2012 through 2016. CEO of the Black Caucus Movement 
in Trinidad and Tobago 2011 through 2013 and pastor of the Ransom AME Zion Church London UK from 2016 to 2020. So he's had a what you might call a both conventional ministerial career and an unconventional one leading different organizations and doing different work in different parts of the globe. Uh, Ron has published two books, Out of Love and Tell, Lessons for the Church in the Ghetto in 2009. And this one, uh, Defying the Odds from the Ghetto to the Globe in 2013. And uh, this one, which I have and have read, I really like it because it speaks to the authenticity of the man, it speaks to his deep spirituality, but also to his realness not afraid, doesn't hide some of the difficult times that he's gone through, difficult experiences he's had in his life. He lays it out for us to see and for us to learn and gain knowledge from. He's written and published articles in several academic journals on black theology, pan-Africanism, Afrocentricity, and contemporary African affairs. He's a regular traveler to the African continent, where he's involved in leadership development as a lecturer, motivational speaker, and preacher. The past year, he's traveled to Ghana, Kenya, Gambia, and the Senegal. In January this year, he delivered the Martin Luther King Jr. inaugural lecture in the Gambia. Reverend Nathan currently serves as the Transatlantic Roundtable on Religion and Race, board member and treasurer. He's the National Churches Leaders Forum UK International Director, the Evangelical Association of the Caribbean International Consultant, and he is your pastor in Barbados of the Hoggard AME Zion Church, Jackson St. Michael, Barbados, pastor and senior minister. So maybe you don't realize then what a, a powerful man of God that you have. A deeply spiritual man and a man that has great love for his people. So it's my delight and my honor to introduce Reverend Ronald Nathan to you. I pray that this evening will be a blessed and powerful evening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Aka. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to be uh, the speaker at this inaugural address during the Emancipation Day here in Barbados. I want to also say greetings to all who are on our call. Uh, including uh, Ambassador Commissar. And greetings to all the members of the Hogard AME Zion Church, uh, under whose auspices I'm speaking today. Okay, I am about to share uh, the screen where I'll be using a PowerPoint presentation to aid us in our lecture today. This lecture comes today within the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the heightened activities and awareness raised by the death of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matters movement, and the ongoing economic fallout that impacts our vulnerable communities now and for years to come. In my presentation today, I will share a personal story, give a few definitions, share a series of quotes that emanates from the Caribbean context. I will make a few comments on each of these quotations, then close my presentation with my assessment of Black theology and its relevance to Black lives with special reference to the Caribbean. Black theology matters to black lives, a Caribbean perspective. I was 12 years old when the black power movement escalated in Trinidad and Tobago, where it impacted the social, cultural, and political context of that country and the Caribbean and further afield. The media, 
and local conversations were dominated with debates and discussions about the call for black power. The only place where there was no comment, no discussion, no debate was in my local church. At that time, I had attended the local Pentecostal church with my grandparents. And so at a Bible study meeting led by our pastor, at the relevant and appropriate time, the pastor gave his normal invitations, any questions. And I raised my hand and he said, yes, Ronald. And I asked the question, pastor, what does the Bible have to say about black power? The question was not received with any enthusiasm and it was never answered by my then pastor. As a matter of fact, it was received with horror. I was reprimanded, exiled to a side room of the church to think about what I had done. Later, my pastor came and uh, further reprimanded me and reported me to my grandfather, who felt that my theological inquiry necessitated a dose of licks for those who live outside of the Caribbean, that's corporal punishment. Fifty years later, I'm still seeking answers as to what God has to say on the world stage uh, within an inter sorry, what God has to say to people of African origin in the Caribbean, on the world stage, and on the international context. So I want to define uh, a few of the terms I'll be using today. First term is theology. Theology, in my estimation, is an organized method for the study of God. And for me, it answers the question, or it seeks to answer the question, what does God have to say? By redefining this term in this way, I want to deprofessionalize the term, which gives the idea that it is only the clergy or the educated classes that can do theology. Next, I want to define the term black theology. Black theology is a process of understanding what God is saying to people of color in a world organized by and for the perpetuation of white supremacy and racism. In other words, black theology interrogates the status quo constructed by European and Western systems of power, including theological and religious power. And it wants to hear what God has to say to uh, black people, people of African heritage and descent. Let me say at this point that I place Caribbean emancipatory theology within the family of black theologies. Thus says the Lord to the people who have been blessed with melanin and whose experiences over the past 500 years was demeaned and deformed by systemic and institutional white uh, supremacy and white racism. My next slide, I want to define the term black as I use it in this paper. This term represents to me people of African heritage and descent, which is though limited, summarizes in the variations of melanin within the pigmentation of the skin in this historical space of the last 500 years. The use of the term people of color would be used, but would be inclusive of other non-white persons. The first quotation I'd like to make comes from 
the leading Caribbean theological voice of the early 20th century, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, the first leader and organizer of the Universal Negro Improvement mm -hmm. Association and African Communities League. Uh, normally known as the UNIA, which was closely aligned to the African Orthodox Church, whose Archbishop Alexander Maguire was the Chaplain General of the UNIA, and if I am right, uh, who came from Antigua. <clears throat> And the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Gabi uh, stated, and you can find these quotations, there are three of them. This quotation, these quotations come from uh, Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Gabi, which was edited by Amy Gabi. God does not give people positions or jobs or good conditions such as they desire. They must do that for themselves. God does not build cities, nor towns, nor nations, nor homes, nor factories. Men and people do that, and all those who want must work for themselves and pray to God to give them strength to do it. In this statement, uh, Gavi is interpreting or articulating uh, the interpretation of human agency and the collaborative partnership that exists, exists between God and humankind in the pursuit of human development. In other words, he is critiquing and criticizing the colonial theological emphasis that created within the minds of colonial citizens a passivity towards achievement, which made God a co-collaborator in the impoverishment of the black masses. In this second quote from Gavi, he states, before we can help the people, we have to destroy the old education. that teaches them that somebody is teaching, is keeping them back and that God has forgotten them and that they cannot. Sorry, I just need to move. Okay. And that they cannot rise because of their color. We can only build with faith in ourselves and with self-reliance, believing in our possibilities that we can rise to the heights in God's creation. Here I want to suggest that Gavi is calling first for decolonizing of theology. Second, a move from the miseducation of the black woman and black man. And thirdly, that he's calling for a repurposing and refocusing of the Christian faith so that it enables and not disable. I want to say that again, so that it enables and not disable black people from fulfilling their creative potential. Given that the Christian church arrived in the Caribbean in the belly of European colonialism and imperialism, given that the Christian church was a bastion of slavery and an active force in educating the slave for servitude and compliance with the plantation economy. It was critical then that Gavi made this, these points, and it remains a major uncompleted work, that of unshackling the Christian faith from the Eurocentric and Western worldview. Black lives will not matter if it continues to be controlled by a colonial theology. The third and last quote from uh, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Gavi. The God we love, the God we adore, the God who sent his son to this world 2,000 years ago, 
never created an inferior man. He is a God that would not in his great love create a superior race, an inferior one. The God that you worship is a God that expects you to be equal of other men. The God that I adore is such a God and he could be no other. Gavi was aware of the negative impact upon the Christian message and upon the followers of the Christian faith. When the Bible was in the hands of colonial slavers, it was shaped and propagated within the crucible of slavery and European colonialism. Here, Gavi identifies the negative impact of Christianity when it is shaped, interpreted, and applied within a context of a European mindset and Western colonialism. This impact damages the African psyche, the black image, and the African imagination, and their capacity and ability to create and to do. The next quote comes from Edward Wilmot Blyden, another Caribbean citizen. He came from St. Croix in what is called the U.S. Virgin Islands. Blyden traveled at the age of 19 to the United States to enter a theological seminary. He was refused entry into three theological seminaries in the U.S. due to his race. He therefore migrated to Liberia, where he became an educator, writer, journalist, diplomat, and a politician. Blyden, in his book, goes on to say, whatever your condition, you do occupy some room in the world. What are you doing to make a return for the room you occupy? There are so many of our people who fail to realize their responsibility, who fail to hear the inspiring call of the past and the prophetic call of the future. All ideas about God are framed within a given social, cultural, and political context. I want to say this again. All ideas about God, whether you are from South America, South Africa, or the southern part of the United States, all ideas about God are framed within a given social, cultural, and political context. In other words, we cannot do theology in a vacuum. Blyden's contribution to the topic and the theme of redemption of Africa by New World Blacks informed Marcus Garvey's thinking, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, and George Padmore of Trinidad and Tobago, and other early Pan-Africanists. His contribution to Christian-Islam relations was also exemplary. And when I, my wife and myself traveled recently to the Gambia and Senegal, we still met people who were quoting Blyden and the work that he had done. Blyden isolates here or identifies here that black pa Palestinian Jew known as Jesus the Christ who said, occupy until I come. Or to use the prophetic message of the late Dr. Miles Monroe of the Bahamas, we are called to purpose. Therefore, if we are called to purpose, we are called to purpose to fill the public spaces of our world. And I want to say public spaces of our region. And that is theological and religious in nature political, social, cultural, educational, environmental, economic, technological, 
and in the era of health and wellness. In other words, there is no way that we can do theology and just stay in church. Our theology must allow us to fill all spaces that impact black lives. These words are well known. Robert Nesta Mali in his song, Redemption Song, uh, states, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear for atomic energy, because none of them can stop the tide. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Some say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the book. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Mali here was theologi theologizing. Part of the breaking free from colonial theology is for us to accept in the Caribbean that black theological voices cannot be limited to departments of religion, theological seminaries, the accredited institution of Christian denominations, or the European and Western biblical commentaries. We need to theologize within a language that is familiar to us. We need to theologize within a culture that is our own. Many times these institutional frameworks that I had mentioned before from European and Western contexts are the official spokesperson and denominational uh, voices that frustrate the voice of the prophet from the underbelly of our societies. And they frustrate us because of their own location, their allegiance, and their commitment to the status quo. This idea is not consistent with an African cultural worldview. It is a Eurocentric Western model that is linked to their own social class system. So to attribute a theological cloak to personalities such as Bob Marley or the Calypsonian singing Sandra is to give divine sanction to Caribbean culture and to Caribbean voices. We too are created in the image and likeness of God. So we should not allow our voices to be marginalized by elitist structures. Bob Marley aids Caribbean Christians and Caribbean Christian ministers and practitioners to bridge the false dichotomy between salvation, described as spiritual, and liberation, described as political. He offers us instead a holism that is redemptive. We can all be evangelists and activists in the work of redemption. We have got to fulfill the book. Winston Bailey, another Calypsonian from the Caribbean and this time from uh, Trinidad, Hello. known also as the Mighty Shadow sang a calypso several years ago called Poverty is Hell. And some of the lyrics of this song says, Poverty is Hell and the angels are in paradise, driving in their limousines where everything is nice and clean. A poor man living in a teeny weeny hut, the children hungry, nothing in the pot. He gone by the neighbor to beg for some rice, the neighbor under pressure, Boy, things ain't nice. He gone in the big shot area to beg. Police put a bullet in his teeny weeny leg. He gone in the courts and he lost the case. The prosecutor say he have a bandit face. Poverty is hell. The mighty shadow like Bob Marley is utilizing and honoring our ancestors by using idioms and language which evolved in these islands 
and which expresses our heart. And he seeks to press the established Christian denominations and other faith institutions to deal with this conundrum, what is called in theological circles, the odyssey, the problem of evil. He adds his voice to those of great theologians of centuries gone past. Here he is asking us to seriously consider how it is in the Caribbean millions of visitors from overseas can experience the Caribbean as paradise while millions of Caribbean citizens experience these same countries as hell. This is a theological problem. This is a theological problem in which many a Christian fail to engage either theologically or practically as we focus our eyes on getting to heaven. The legacy of slavery and colonialism and the current challenges posed by globalization leave the Caribbean region wrestling with systemic poverty as its most pressing social and I would say theological problem. So this is a problem for the church. Recently in a paper presented by the president of the Caribbean Development Bank, he declared that some 22% of the Caribbean population are living below the poverty line. Singing Sandra in one of her calypsos raises another pertinent issue. Here, and I'm reading from on the right side of the screen, I'm a woman who don't make any skylark before I slap them and they die of a heart attack. Tell them they could keep their money, I go keep my honey and die with my dignity. What was this all about? Singing Sandro, who is one of the Caribbean's leading Calypsonians with her commitment to the Orisha faith and the spiritual Baptist religion, speak to the womanist theological cause when she shares her desire to have dignity in life and in death. death. She raises the issues of exploitation and humiliation which so many of our women in the Caribbean face on a daily basis whether through domestic violence, lack of educational opportunity, labor relations, place and role in the Christian church or as victims of sexual exploitation, they find themselves at risk. And so I come and agree with Professor Noel Leo Erskine who is one of the predominant uh, writers of Caribbean emancipation theology when he says colonial theology could not, cannot address our situation. The threats to our life and freedom, our struggles for food and dignity, it cannot speak for us and it cannot from within our encounter with God from within our cries and tears, or from within the suffering colonialism has inflicted upon us. It can only reflect the colonizers' interests and use the gospel to justify oppression and to call for submission and resignation. Jesus Christ, in speaking to uh, the apostles, said, feed my sheep. Yet so many within the Christian church would fleece the sheep. And it is our responsibility to return to that high calling that Jesus gave us. Black theology, therefore, in conclusion, matters as it allows the Christian church an opportunity to engage and enhance black lives in the 21st century in the Caribbean. Black theology matters to black lives as it allows other sectors of the Caribbean community to discuss how theology can be a liberating tool. 
Black theology matters to black lives as it allows our Afrocentric worldview expression in social, economic, political, cultural, and spiritual forms. Black theology matters to black lives in the Caribbean as it engages with the continued struggle of the Caribbean people for reparatory justice. Black theology matters to black lives as it seeks emancipation from the endemic and intergenerational poverty that diminishes the lives of the masses. Black theology matters to black lives as we engage in the struggle for equal rights for all women in our society. Black theology matters to black lives when we reject racism and colorism in all its forms in the Caribbean. Black theology matters to black lives when we join the call for a new economic agenda that will address the discriminatory practices faced by small island states seeking development. Black theology matters to black lives when our sermons, our prophecies, our testimonies, our prayers and offerings also demand environmental justice in an age of climate change. Black theology matters to black lives when we use our networks and international partnerships to resist the bullying tactics of Western countries and the international institutions. Black theology matters to black lives, so we must speak truth to power in our islands and mainline, mainline territories that seek to undermine our economic, social, cultural, and political systems. Black theology matters to black lives when we are able to transform the outdated justice systems with concepts such as relational justice. Black theology matters to black lives when we decide to do theology different in the Caribbean. That includes rediscovering the black presence in the Bible. Black theology matters to black lives as we deconstruct and interrogate Western Christianity and the role it has played in the Caribbean. Black theology matters to black lives as we reconstruct the black image of God in us that allows us to celebrate our full African humanity. Black theology matters to black lives because black lives matter to God. Matters to God in terms of who we were, who we are, and who we desire to be here in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean diaspora, and across the globe. Then and only then can we join with others in declaring that all lives do matter. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much for that word pastor nathan that was definitely quite a bit thank you thank you um you want to take a drink of water before i give you that first question <laughs> Okay, I, I'm going to go straight to the questions because I want us to get the most out of all this knowledge and all this sharing that has just taken place. So on the point that you were talking about poverty, yes, poverty is hell. The question that comes, what will Christians do in post-COVID poverty? Okay, let me just enlarge my screen. What would Christians do in post-COVID poverty? I, I, I think I want to say that most Christians will do just what they did before, which is pray. They will continue to their activities of uh, seeking to make ends meet. I think 
uh, what I would suggest is that we within the church and outside of the church have to look at new uh, types of uh, economic activity. Um, here in Barbados, we know that one of the strongest areas of black economic empowerment has been uh, uh, the credit unions. And I would certainly push for every single um, member of a Christian church and beyond to become members of credit unions that help to serve uh, their community on which they can have part ownership in. Uh, but secondly, I would say that we need to more, be more discrimi discriminating in where we spend our money and how we use our money. We need to understand that where you spend your money, that is where you create skills, that is where you create jobs, and that is where you create wealth. And until we understand that and understand that if we want to be employers, then we have got to develop businesses. And we need to support uh, black businesses in every which way that we can. And that's the only way that we'll actually get out of poverty. We need to stop praying for a job and start praying that we be producers of jobs. Amen. Amen. I, and because this is a lecture and not a discussion with just the two of us, I'm going to go straight into the next question <laughs> because out of that I had many more questions. And the next question comes when exploitation is evident in churches among black preachers how can we expect change um i i, I believe that uh, members of our churches and these are predominantly women have got to use their power and use their voice to demand a different experience in church uh, the church is supposed to be a liberating institution and we have got to make sure that it lives up to that uh, ideal. Uh, the idea that because uh, the pastor is in quotes called of God means that he is above um, criticism or above correction is not biblical, and it certainly ought not to be sustained in churches today. Okay, thank you. Our next question, is Caribbean Black theology exclusively Christian, post-Christian, or more than Christian? What does that mean for those of us who have been brought up in a colonial Christian context where exclusiveness is revered? Do you want me to repeat that? Just the last part, where exclusiveness is? Revered. Revered. Yes. Um, all peoples reflect on God. So therefore, all people do theology. All people, depending uh, very much on where they are located in their experience. So if they grew up in a family that is Islamic or a family that are Hindus or a family that are Christians, all of them, wherever they are, they reflect on God. And so they are not supposed to be excluded from the conversation. Okay. Uh, we are supposed to be free to be able to speak to each and anyone uh, about our faith, about our faith convictions, and so forth. Uh, what we have found is that uh, a great hostility has developed among, um, uh, within the Caribbean between Christians and people of other faiths. And this is one where the prejudice of um, uh, colonialism uh, bears fruit. Because uh, especially in territories such as uh, Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana and Suriname, uh, there was this conflict that uh, these people who have come and taken our jobs, etc., 
uh, and they come with their other gods. Well, uh, when you read the Bible, um, you find many people of different religions. You find Jesus engaging, and Jesus doesn't ask the question, um, can you first tell me your religion before I feed you? He doesn't ask the question, can you first tell me your religion before I, I lay hands on you? Jesus went around, according to uh, the Caribbean song, everywhere he went, he was doing good. Okay. Uh, and so we have to preach the gospel. Yes, the gospel uh, of Jesus, um, about Jesus Christ, reveals that uh, Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. Um, but that does not place us in a position either of superiority or um, exclusiveness. We can be faithful to the claims of the um, faith. And I, I want you to um, note that in my uh, presentation, uh, I have not dealt with the issue of the Bible per se. Okay, uh, I'm dealing about theology. Now, theology is how we interpret uh, our theology um, affects our interpretation of the Bible. It affects how we interpret the Bible and how we apply the Bible, okay? And so um, I, I believe that uh, everybody can come in on the discussion. Um, however, as a Christian, there are certain um, statements of faith that we hold to, and uh, we need to be faithful uh, in that. There is also um, some dialogue between uh, Christians and people of other faiths and I myself have been involved in some of those uh, whether here or on the African continent. Okay, thank you. The next question is please explain how black theology is engaging with climate change in the Caribbean. Okay. Please explain how black theology is engaging with climate change in the Caribbean. Okay, I, I think I need to um, uh, state and, if you wish, confess that um, Black theology in the Caribbean, as far as my assessment is, um, I've only recently returned to the Caribbean after being away for um, three years. Um, uh, uh, but to me, my assessment of Black theology in the Caribbean or Caribbean emancipatory theology is that it is at a low ebb at the moment. And having said that, uh, I believe that uh, climate change has to be addressed by everyone in the society and by every institution in the society. And so how does black theology encourage uh, the Christian church or those under the influence of black theology? Because there are some who have uh, <laughs> Christian faith, but they are not prepared to sit in the Christian church because of um, the church's behavior towards them, etc. So I'm not excluding them. But um, what I'm saying is we all have a responsibility and that responsibility begins first with education, second with action, and thirdly with partnership with other um, parts of the community and other international bodies to guard um, our environment. We know that here in the Caribbean, we are susceptible to uh, hurricanes and storms, and those are becoming more severe because of climate change. And so we need to join with fellow Christians at a local level, at a regional level, whether it's through the Caribbean Conference of Churches or the Evangelical Association of the Caribbean. And we need to join at an international level with the World Council of Churches or the World Evangelical um, Alliance to be able to bring pressure to bear on those countries that are most damaging the um, environment. Okay, thank you. Is the impact of colonialism on the psyche of African descendants comparable in the Caribbean to the descendants in Britain? Is 
Read it to me one more time. Is the impact of colonialism on the psyche of African descendants comparable in the Caribbean to the descendants in Britain? Okay, um, I, I would say yes. I would say yes, and I'll say not only comparable to the Caribbean and um, Europe, but also in Africa. Okay. Um, I find it very difficult when I'm in Ghana uh, and I face the number of white images of Jesus that I can't understand. And, and that tells me that the colonial exercise is still healthy and well in, Af in Africa. And for many, I, I still go into people's homes uh, here in the Caribbean and you see, you know, all sorts of images uh, that is that isn't historically correct, isn't ethically correct, isn't racially correct, isn't biblically correct. But these images are there. And if those images are there, then the messages that come with those images are also present. What I would say that is different is that we do see in the Caribbean more people of African descent in positions of leadership. The question we have to ask is, what are their models for their leadership? Are those models still the same European colonial models that existed before uh, independence? So um, my, my answer would be um, yes, it, we are still uh, damaged. We have more um, foreign television uh, programs than programs produced in the Caribbean. And so the um, people's concepts about Africa, in this, the 21st century, people still have a mindset of Africa in a way that has never been true. But it's certainly the story of somebody Thank you. This is very difficult for me because I again I want to go I want to come in there because when you said the point about the leaders in the Caribbean being of African descent, but it seems as though they're what they refer to as Oreos, where the African on the outside, but we are so much ingrained on the inside with the colonialism that we we it's just our outward appearance that's different, and that's another discussion that we can go on to. But let me keep to the question. But, um uh, uh, in a pastoral role, uh, that is not a term that I would encourage my members to be using. Which okay. one? Um, Oreos. Okay, okay, or that concept. And the reason I'm saying that is all of us are in a process of transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 30 years ago, I was not saying these things that I'm saying now. Right. Okay. But as I gain information and learn and interact with people, you begin. So um, there are some people who are trying their best, but they're trying their best within a context and using models that are not the best for them. Right. So uh, we have to, I want to say, um, be mindful of the struggle. And this is a struggle that is international, uh, it is one that is reinforced on the left and on the right. So it's, um, we need to be mindful of people and help them in the process. Right. Okay. Next question. How do you get pastors who are often male to listen to their female members, particularly when it comes to building and import, and in, sorry, to building and empowering rather than passive theology, particularly in economics. The lack of men, potential husbands, how to get politically active to address the oppressive system that kill and, and criminalize our sons. That is three, if not four questions. Yes. <laughs> yes. How do you get pastors to empower? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I, th as I said, I believe that women in church have much more power than they think they have. 
and they have to use that power. And some of it may be um, to walk with their pocketbook and their handbag and walk out and say, we are not taking this kind of behavior. We cannot have it that Christian leaders are going from one woman to the next in the church, have a relationship with all of them, and all of them sit down there and say they're worshiping the Lord. We've got to do something different. That is, it's sinful, and it's got to be exposed. We cannot accept that. Okay, we need... Um, and there are access these days to um, different types of training. Women can get uh, theological training and open your own churches. There are other churches that are looking for pastors. Okay, um, denominational structures are becoming much more um, fluid these days. You know, so we don't have to, um, you know, take that sort of stuff anymore. Okay, so I think that's one question. Then there was a question about economics. Yes. Um, well, building and empowering rather than passive theology when it comes to um, economics. Well, I don't think their um, theology or their practices are passive when it comes to their salary or the car they want to buy. Okay, uh, it's passive when it comes to the empowerment of others, either in the church or in the community. Okay? And so, uh, buy a book for your pastor. Okay, buy, yeah, give him a gift. Give him a book. Buy him um, different kinds of books. Okay, um, leave Joel or Steen alone and get something from Miles Monroe that is a little more... Um, you know, educated, uh, you know, um, send them to a conference, okay? Send them to a conference that is progressive. All right, we have to do um, things that are different. Okay? We can't have, in, in this time and in this age, we cannot have churches that are just holding service and not doing service. Right. Okay. So a follow-up to that part of our of our discussion, um, the suggestion is that we have a, we give a talk on this subject of male abuse of power and women in the church. That's the suggestion. Being, um, it came as a question, yeah. um, but I believe it's more of a suggestion that that be considered as one of your topics. Yeah, I'll right, uh, uh, move on. There was yeah. a there was a follow up on the previous question, but I'll bring that nearer to the end. I'll go to another question. What is your view on the African context in relation to theology and economic development of the poor? The rich become richer, and the poor lost in poverty. The colonialists now destroy their people. Well, um, I I think I've revealed my um my hand quite clearly in this um talk. Uh, I believe, first of all, that God is a God of the oppressed. Okay? You read from Genesis through to the Revelation, uh, God is always looking out for the poor, the widow, the orphan, uh, the sick. Okay? Um, so my, my view is that we have to find different ways and means of addressing these issues of poverty and not through um, what is called prosperity theology. That further marginalizes the poor and make poor people even feel worse than they are. Okay? But what we need is to be able to restructure our, our churches or denominations so that uh, we are more outward looking than inward looking. And that includes what we do with our monies. Okay. Um, we, we have to create institutions if there are no such institutions. While I was in the UK, I sat on the um, 
Pentecostal Credit Union. The Pentecostal Credit Union in the UK is the largest black financial institution in the UK. Right? Um, and so we have to um, put our money where our mouths are and do things that would benefit um, our people. We also have to get involved in the education that is necessary. Okay? If the pastor won't hold the um, economic empowerment uh, conference in their church, do it in the community center. Okay? Um, but we've got to get to a place where we are no longer uh, just, where the church is no longer just dependent on um, tithes and offerings. Okay? The church itself needs to go in business. For years, I criticized the United Kingdom Black Church for the fact that for um, over 70 years since the Windrush, we have been in churches wearing hats that other people are making when we could have make our own hats. Not one hat factory in, in the United Kingdom that is black owned. The Italians target us. As a matter of fact, they come to the black church conference to sell hats. All right, let me, let me quiet down a little uh, and drink a glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back to the follow-up question, which was the one on climate. Um, that was, what will you be doing to take, to take the issue of climate change forward? What will you be doing to take the issue of climate change forward? Is this a member of my church? <laughs> 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 okay. Um, <laughs> they're waving at you. I don't know if you can see, but they're waving at Wave you. Let me see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, Sister Velma, how are you? <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, I think um, I, one of the first areas, I, we have had a couple of discussions on this already. Our women's um, our department and our um, First Lady of the Church uh, raised the issues of um, uh, climate change and just the recycling of used products. And so, um, as a matter of fact, I'm very impressed by uh, the ladies of our church who uh, do a lot to uh, recycle. Uh, but I want to go on further to say that um, we will be looking to make alliances with others in our community and on island in terms of uh, dealing with the issue of climate change and then looking to the region and seeing what's happening um, in CARICOM and uh, the region as far as that is concerned. And so wherever, but um, part of our education is sermons on the environment and on environmental themes, Bible studies, and so forth. Okay, thank you. That's it for the questions that are in the chat. So I now open the floor for, have, for questions to come from the floor. Okay. So if you want to just unmute yourself and bring your question and try as much as possible to restrict it to a question. My yes. question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, obviously, they are in ignorance. But last, um, last comments of the pastor, he talked of um, climate change. I want him to please um, give me an example of what the church can do. Okay. Um, I, I'm pleased that you asked this, seeing um, that I know what your position is in the church. Um, one of the first things we can do is to start using solar in our church instead of electricity. Mm -hmm. That is one of the first areas. We have got a natural energy source in our region that is underutilized, and that's the first um, thing we can do. I would like to also suggest that maybe one of the things we ought to be looking at is buying a church van and letting people leave their cars at home. 
Oh. Amen to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that alone would save a lot of um, energy. Okay. If we could, uh, you know, go around, pick up people rather than everybody driving to church. Amen. All right. Okay. So those are two areas, um, Reverend Delaney. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I see that um, Dr. Thelma was coming on earlier. Yes, go ahead. I wanted to ask you, Rev, you mentioned about the sexual exploitation, that abuse of power in the church. In the past, I've done training around this subject and it just occurred to me, would you um, take on something like that to do some awareness raising? Because you have the contacts here, and plus, but I'm really thinking more of the Caribbean rather than here in London, in England. But would you consider, because you've mentioned it, would you consider having some kind of awareness raising. It could begin in Barbados because I've noticed that a lot of pastors do not want to tackle this subject. I've brought it up before and have even de delivered training material in Jamaica and here, but pastors do not want to touch that subject. Um, is that, can I throw that challenge out to you? Well, uh, you've thrown it already. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, uh, and what I'm doing at the moment is throwing it up in the air and seeing if I can hold that with all the other things that I'm doing. But um, I, as a pastor with responsibility for my church members, I have a duty before God and to them to preach the whole counsel of God. And the whole counsel of God includes... Uh, dealing with um, sexual exploitation. Uh, just last Wednesday in our Bible study, I raised the issue of um, a young woman being selected for her uh, virginity and her youthfulness to go into the bed with King David. And I said, um, and I raised the question about what, what does this say about that society? Okay, uh, when, you know, and I even asked one of my members if, um, if somebody came and said, uh, we want to um, take your, your granddaughter to use in this way, what would you say? That I'm sure you'll have the shotgun out and, um, <laughs> you know. So we have to critique it. Uh, what I'm saying is that every local pastor, whether they take it up as a, uh, an issue on a national platform or a regional platform, every local pastor has a responsibility to speak to that issue and to address it so that, uh, and, and the issue of dom domestic violence. Exactly, yes, yes. Uh, these are critical issues that exist, okay? We have people coming to church. I'm not saying I have any evidence of anybody in my church. But uh, the statistics tell me that there ought to be at least one in my church that is being domestically abused. You know, so we have to deal with these issues. Um, I, I would have to investigate further as to what exactly is being done. Um, uh, I have only been in the country for about four months mm -hmm. in Barbados. So oh, I'm yes. still uh, finding my feet and finding out exactly what is happening where. But um, certainly uh, it's an issue that need raising and any platform that I have in anywhere, the matter will be raised. But okay. in terms of taking it on as a specific um, a responsibility, I, I have to say, wait and see. Not because I don't think it's important. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what exists so far. Okay, thank you. We can link up on this later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sister Velma, any other questions, please? Please feel free to jump in and ask your question. Just turn your audio on. 
faster on I it's um uh, Carol here. Thanks yes. so much for um um your talk is fantastic. And so you say, for example, salvation and liberation should not be separated. We can all be evangelists and active and activists in the work of redemption. And I thought that so many churches in the UK, I don't know about the Caribbean, are so far away from that. And I know you've mentioned, for example, um, that people can, if you like, educate their pastors, give them the book and so forth and, and prompt them to go to certain conferences. But I feel that there's a, the, the culture is so far removed from that. Um, I'm just wondering about what people can do. This is members of the congregation from a, from a strategic point of view to, to nudge that. Because it, it's, it's a big thing. Obviously, we've had the whole George Floyd thing. And, and I know a lot of pastors are what we call in woke now and are speaking out. But I still don't feel, of those who are speaking out, I don't feel they have the tools. And there's some who are still confused and there's some who still aren't doing anything. So what, what can we do to nudge that strategically? Where should we be putting our efforts? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I want to say that there's good news on the horizon. Okay, uh, just this morning, there was a webinar um, I'm reading here. I've just facilitated an exciting session on justice with Bishop Delroy Powell and about 60 pastors and lay leaders of the New Testament Assembly. That happened this morning on the subject, are we doing justice? Justice. Okay. So, um, uh, there, there are some discussions coming up in different uh, fora um, around the UK, uh, especially in light of um, the George Floyd and Black Lives move, Movement. And you know what? I think that the Black Lives Movement won't allow the Black Church to go back to business as usual. Okay? Because one, um, the Black Lives Movement as a civil rights movement is the first movement in 250 years that is not led by the black church. Wow. Now that says something, huh? That says something because we have lost our moral authority, I believe. But uh, be that as it may, those folks won't allow us to remain silent any longer. And I think that a number of young people in our churches are forcing, uh, let me say, older ministers or more staid ministers or conservative ministers to begin to move and to address some of the issues that they are facing. Um, I, I hope that helps there, um, Carol. Uh, there are... It gives me hope. It does give me a bit of hope in terms of the, the conversations. Um, I just wonder whether they've got the kind of supporting infrastructure where there's plans for them to put in support infrastructure to maintain a high level of exploration well I, of course, think, yeah. I think that um, one of the um, difficulties with the um, UK um, scene is the uh, amount of division that there is within the um, black church community uh, even with the National um, Christian Leaders Forum uh, there is still not uh, in, in that forum, I think uh, we may be only talking about three to four hundred um, church leaders. Uh, and the um, black church scene in the UK is at least um, 4,000 um, uh, church leaders. So we're talking about um, just about 10%. So uh, the greater unity we have is the greater strength we would have. And that raises the level. Um, um, can I say that as, I, as I'm listening to this, I'm wondering, a lot of people have said that COVID has forced the church to do church in a different way, to engage the Bible and people in a different way, that they never thought they could do church without laying hands and, and all, all the other traditional things that one does in church. And I'm wondering if a view of us being kingdom workers will help us remove ourselves from this is my church, that is your church, and work to the bigger picture of kingdom, which is what God wants of us. And if by doing that we can, so if a church doesn't have the expertise or the will, if the people are able to see themselves as being part of a bigger group, 
rather than just that church, they can get some, let me say, oomph, some encouragement, some, some something that allows them to become part of the solution as opposed to sitting in the swamp of the problem. Um, I, I want to agree with you um, there. I won't add much to that except to um, uh, say that uh, many of our young people, in particular our millennials, are not tied to denomination and a local church as used to exist before. And so they are getting involved in different things and they very well may be the hope um, or many churches uh, and, and go beyond just the limit. So for example, we have people from uh, local churches in uh, the Caribbean that are going out as missionaries with uh, uh, what they call parachurch organizations, not with their denomination missions board. Mm. No. So um, th there is um, room uh, for a wider expression. And, you know, we have to understand that this is not the first pandemic that the uh, world community has faced, and it will not be the last. Yeah. And all of these will bring challenges. We, we are challenged when there is wealth, and we are challenged when there is poverty. We are challenged when um, uh, there are calamities taking place and we are challenged in good times. It's just that we get lazy. Okay. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions, we're approaching the 430 mark. Is there, do we have any other questions before we go to the vote of thanks? No, I, I therefore invite. I think, I think I see Sister Edith. Um, yes. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, yeah. go ahead, Sister Edith. I, I, I know that we are looking at the Caribbean specifically this afternoon, but I would like to try to understand how we can help Africans to come out of being dependent on what comes out to them from Europe because of their poverty. This, this whole thing of uh, climate change is one matter. But when I've lived in Cameroon for an extended period, and what really hurts and frightens me is how much, how much the people depend on old fridges, old pots and pans, old bath towels, old underwear that's coming in from Europe that they can afford simply because they're so poor and how it is fed into a society until they feel that that is all that they can do you know um, because it comes in so many ways I mean in the church you see women in old hats old broken down shoes old clothes that are not suitable for the weather because people are sending it to them because they are poor one of the first challenges that I had to deal with in Cameroon as a missionary was people telling me that they were poor in the richest continent on earth. I mean, it was very, it was heartbreaking for me and I had to learn how to deal with it. But it is something that the church itself needs to deal with in Africa and in the Caribbean too, because we are having a similar problem. Uh, with all the stuff that is coming down because of hurricanes and so on. Now, I heard um, a pastor from the Caribbean speak to the church in Cameroon and tell them, you have to connect with the church in the West Indies to understand how to deal with what is happening in Africa. Now, how and when is the church in the Caribbean going to deal with ourselves so that we can deal with anybody else. These are discussions that need to be uh, uh, taken, taken in mind, you know, because it goes into the politics and, and these are Christian politicians who are speaking, who say, well, if you can buy a T-shirt 
even if it is used for 50 francs, instead of having to spend 500 francs, at least you can, can um, clothe your children. So he's a, they're, they're, I'm listening to this lecture, um, Pastor Ron's lecture, and I'm really looking at the depth and the width that we have to deal with as Christians and as the church. It really is almost baffling. So where do we begin, really? Where do we begin? I mean, we cannot divorce ourselves as Caribbean people from Africa because we know that we are one. We cannot divorce ourselves. So how are we going to look at these, um, these situations from a very realistic point of view? You know, um, conversations between pastors, between pastors and members, like this, this, this particular interaction we're having this afternoon. I find it extremely useful. And this is what should be taking place so that people can bring their own ideas to bear on how we act and the responsibility that we take as Christians. I mean, when you really think of it, I'm not surprised that many people just let it pass them by because it is a mind-boggling situation that we're dealing with as Christians. How do we relate between what the Bible says and what we can do or what we feel like doing or not doing. Because many Christians, let's, be, let's uh, face it, don't feel like doing anything. They can pray and that's it, you know? Or they can, they can give their money and that's it, but they're not doing anything to make this situation better. That is uh, both a question and a comment. All right, um, so the, Edith, there are um, many questions there, and you know Africa is very, very close to my heart. Um, this should not have been the last question uh, one minute before we finish. Uh, <laughs> okay, but um, let, me, let me just say this. Uh, in dealing with the African on the African continent, uh, it is important that we pro approach the issue of poverty uh, from, a, from two sides. We have to look at the education that is uh, given even on the African continent. And we'll find that that education is not much different to what was taught way back in the colonial times. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so they are educated to see themselves as poor yeah. and to see themselves as dependent on European and Western aid. Okay, a um, uh, young lady, I'm trying to remember what her full name is. You know, Moyo was one of Damisa. Damisa, I think it's Damisa Moyo, uh, wrote a book uh, basically saying, stop giving aid to Africa. Yeah. because it's crippling Africa um, because Africa has all the resources it needs to develop itself as a matter of fact there is one thing if Africa just did this one thing it would take about 500 million people out of poverty within three years and that is if they would just trade among themselves if they just trade among themselves. Um, but so I was saying there are two things that uh, need to be the education. So we need to educate. I worked with um, people in the slums of Nairobi uh, for several years. And um, I uh, said to them that uh, there was a, a famine in the northern part of the country hadn't had rain so a long time and they were asking us to um, write to the European countries and development agencies and so forth to get monies to be able to aid the people in the north of the country and um, I said to them I'm not writing a single letter unless you also from within your own communities raise some money to help your own people, okay? And they kept saying, well, we don't have any money. We have I said, okay, let me break it down for you. I need each person 
to bring an egg, bring a pint of milk, bring something that we could sell to raise money. And they were so surprised at how much money they raised. They never thought they could raise that kind of money. Um, the Jamaicans have a saying, one, one cocoa fills the basket. And that is exactly what happened. And until people see, they were never the same, you know. They were never the same. I said, don't ever ask people to give you money and you don't give something as well. That's right. But you've got to, and you have to start from there. So there's that on one hand. And then we have to also hold African um, governments and um, their bureaucracy to a higher standard of accountability. And that has to be done. The church uh, within any community has, um, and nation has to start coming together and calling um, its leaders to a better level of accountability as far as the wealth of Africa is concerned. Uh, that's just um, a starting point. Okay? Uh, as you know, I also uh, uh, spend a lot of time in getting involved in leadership development. And I think one of the things that has happened, and this is a combination of the last question and yours, is that um, I need to use social media more to uh, do some of the educating work with um, young um, uh, African uh, church leaders in helping to uh, raise their awareness and uh, do some more training. So thank you for the question. Um, Pastor, we have, we are six minutes over, but we have one more question that's being requested. And I know when you hear this question, if you allow it, you're going to say, <laughs> why didn't it come before? Um, Go, can I go ahead and let the person ask the question? Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Sister Velma. That's the last one, yeah. Rev, yes, I know. I suddenly remembered the young man who spoke at the beginning, and he spoke about Bossa and ah. the rebellion. So what I forgot is what, if anything, are the black churches doing in terms of the call for reparations bearing in mind that the Archbishop of Canterbury has apologized for the church's role in um, the enslavement of Africans. So, uh, you know, I've sent out, you know, I've been sending out letters, etc., to churches here. I've not heard a word. So I don't know if you can fill in anything about conversations happening in the black churches around reparations. Um, and you're speaking about in the U.S., um, in the U.K., sorry. Or in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, well, I, there's not much. I, I, um, I think there is a lonely few yeah. of us who are raising that issue in the U.K. However, um, even here in the Caribbean, there are some, um, there were some pronouncements back in the... 90s uh, from the Caribbean Conference of Churches, but I'm not quite sure exactly where they are with that at the moment. Uh, as a, no, I can tell you that the Caribbean Conference of Churches is extremely weak at this point in time, um, and their influence is even uh, less than when um, they first started. So I'm not sure how much they are able to do. Uh, what I would like to um, say for your prayers and consideration is uh, from our church in Trinidad, uh, four years, yes, four years ago, um, I was pastor of one of our churches in Trinidad, and we put forward a resolution to our general conference, which met in the United States in 20. 16 on um, the issue of reparations and that is coming back to the conference floor next year mm -hmm. uh, and in that we are asking first of all for our denomination to endorse the call for reparations and then secondly that our denomination also seek 
to send ambassadors to all of the major black denominations in the U.S. because our church is headquarters in the U.S. Um, to get them on board. And then the third stage to take it to the World Council of Churches. Because we feel that it is at that level that some of the European countries uh, would, uh, would not be able to um, sideline the discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for all those questions. Um, they really were intriguing. We really have a lot more for discussion out of that. So we're looking forward to that. And no more talk from me. I now invite our sister Pamela Wall to bring us the vote of thanks. Yes, good evening, everyone. It was truly a, a, a wonderful learning evening. And on the behalf of the pastor and members of Hogard Amy Zion Church, I want to give a heartful thank you to all who participated in this Emancipation Lecture. First of all, I want to give all my thanks to God for allowing this event to happen, to drop it in the pastor and allowing him to do it. And also for keeping his hands on the internet and allowing everything to run smoothly. I want to give thanks to Tariq. Tariq, we really, really appreciated what you did. You really do. Keep on doing what you can. Let no one stop you from doing what you have to do. Amen. Dr. William, thank you for coming all the way from England to introduce our dear pastor. We really appreciate that. Reverend Grant, we thank you. And our Zoom friends and family, we could have done all this. But if y'all weren't here, it would have been a wasted evening. And we thank all of you for coming and joining with us. Reverend Nathan, we thank you. It was a really educational lecture. And I can tell you it was well received. You are so full of knowledge and we look forward we really do look forward. I look forward to the next one. When will it be? I don't know. <laughs> Hope soon, but I really look forward to the next lecture. Once again, I give thanks to God for allowing him to drop the information, everything in you, so that you can pass it on to us. And I say thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sister Pam, at this point. In a normal environment of a physical lecture, I would now say I invite you to join us for refreshments. But <laughs> as we have no refreshments that I can invite you to join us for, all I would say to you, us, ah, Reverend Joseph is showing me her refreshments. <laughs> What I would say at this point is that we will end the official recording now, but you feel free to stick around and have a little chit chat with the rest of us if you care to. But as of this point, let's just imagine that we're going off to the to the cocktail table to have some wine and cheese. Non-alcoholic wine that will be. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural Emancipation Day lecture. And we certainly look forward to you joining us again for our next lecture series. Thank you and have a good night.